and welcome to the Print Soft Cover, our online platform for the launch of select non-fiction books. Today, we are launching Critical Mass, Decoding India's Nuclear Policy, a Bloomsbury India publication. I have the book right here. In today's conversation, we have the author of the book, Professor R. Raja Raman with us. Professor Raja Raman is an internationally renowned theoretical physicist with a long and distinguished career. He is an emeritus professor at Jawaharlal Nehru University and also works on nuclear policy issues. He is a founding member and past co-chair of the International Panel on Fissile Materials, a member of the Asia-Pacific Leadership Network, a council member of the International Pugwash. He was part of the expert group that set the hands of the iconic doomsday clock. This book offers a unique perspective on nuclear developments in India, covering both civil and military affairs. Welcome, Professor, to the Prince of Cover. Thank you. Nice to be here. So to get right into it, any issue, as you know, uh, that arises from the word nuclear eventually leads to a discussion steeped in hyperbole, stating that for our viewers, my first question is with regards to India's nuclear regulatory authority. Currently, the regulator for nuclear safety in India is the Atomic Energy Regulatory Board, or the AERB, which reports to the Atomic Energy Commission of India, whose chairman is a part of the Department of Atomic Energy, which also funds the AERB. In essence, the regulator is funded by the very department that it is charged to watch over. Efforts for an independent regulator, such as the Nuclear Safety Regulatory Authority, has been in limbo since 2011. What are the risks of not having an independent regulator? And why does it seem that nuclear safety and regulation, or the conversation around this, has taken a back seat in India today, sir? Well, Firstly, I agree with all the statements you made about the importance of a regulatory authority. And uh, government hasn't taken it too seriously up to a certain point because the nuclear deal with the US was done and there was no need to make anybody happy any longer. Whereas at the nuclear deal time, the questions were raised. We don't know if we can give you more support. We don't have a regulator. So in most of the world, uh, the nuclear community, they have nuclear regulators for whatever reactors they have. Therefore, uh, it's expected that we would do the same. And we've got away without doing it now. And uh, uh, next time we have to change a new on any aspect with the rest of the world, this will definitely come up in a big way. Uh, plus, another problem with nuclear regulatory authority here, unlike, for instance, the US, where Nuclear reactors are spread over at different universities. And I went there as a graduate student. Someone told me I'm standing on top of the reactor which is below. So every university or major institution has a reactor, something like that. So it's not such an alien object. In India, thanks to the way Mr. Baba constructed the thing, all nuclear knowledge is uh, contained inside the DAE establishment. Uh, and no university has a course on nuclear reactors. For a while, there was an attempt to do so, but it fell because uh, the graduates have no place to get a job. Because again, DA is the only place which would have people. So one way or the other, we don't really have regulatory authority. And we don't even have people outside the community who you can bring in as regulators, who know the subject. Because all the products of the Baba Atomic Energy Group stay inside Baba. So this has been a problem why we don't have a regulator. And uh, as long as things are going well, fine. But if there is a problem, then uh, there have been one or two minor problems with our reactors. And one had to take the DA's word for it, that we've taken care of. They're all honorable men, so no doubt they have. But in, a, in terms of an institutional arrangement, there is nothing now. Yes, sir. And, and as you said, you know, 
there were questions about this when it came up with with regards to the US India civil nuclear deal and you have an entire chapter devoted to the saga around this uh, nuclear deal that began uh, discussions and negotiations in 2005 and then finally came to fruition in 2008 uh you know the result and in your chapter you also cover the results to an extent uh, where you look at you know outside nuclear energy companies such as Westinghouse from the United States or Areva of France you know setting up plants in India so what is the importance of this deal sir of the US India nuclear deal and 15 years later has it had a major impact on India's nuclear program well, sadly, it has not had an impact. Uh, it holds out the potential of one buying reactors from abroad, because there was a time when it was thought we need thirty reactors, fifty reactors. Uh, there was a lot of enthusiasm. Question was, we don't have the manpower to build thirty reactors or even twenty, so we would have to buy some. And when you buy them, then you have to need the international community's approval on all aspects of your reactor strategy. So while the nuclear deal was going on, the idea was that we would be buying many reactors from abroad. And we ended up not buying any of them. So nothing much has happened. Even if we didn't have the deal, we would be no different from today. So that unfortunately is the thing. India's nuclear ambitions were much more in 2005 than, than today, when they seem to be happy to settle with what you have. The Indian nuclear doctrine is built upon the principle of credible minimum deterrence. How effective has India been in keeping with the principle of minimum deterrence? And why is it often argued that India needs to build a nuclear arsenal of weapons larger than other nations? Well, um, that is because people do not understand the meaning of the word deterrent let alone minimal deterrent. A deterrent is something which should stop the bad guys, the other side, from doing you any harm. And if you therefore have enough for him to worry about, that's good enough, that's a deterrent. That I use an analogy which is slightly scary, but if you have a few, if you have a Matiya Dawn whom you want to deter, all you have to do is to kidnap his boy. You know, I mean, I'm not, don't want to give ideas, but the mafia don't have these ideas already. So, uh, so it doesn't take much to have a uh, deterrent in your hand. You don't have to be bigger than the mafia don't. You don't have to kill him. You don't have to do some. In the same way, to deter, for instance, uh, even the U.S. Look at what North Korea has done. North Korea has barely a hand, handful of weapons, but it has deterred the U.S. They are scared. They don't want to go and tamper with North Korea. Uh, they are not scared that North Korea will attack them. They know that if they do, then North Korea is finished. At the same time, they know that it's got half a dozen weapons which can reach uh, San Francisco, which can reach Los Angeles across the, the, the Pacific. So you can have a very small arsenal and still deter another place as long as what you can do is unacceptable to them. So if you say kill 100,000 people, there may be some dictators who may say, fine, I don't care. But most countries nowadays are democracies, and even, even modern-day dictators are not what Mao used to say, that I will send in you know, waves and waves of people, you shoot them all down, we are more people. Uh, but most leaders of the world, including uh, totalitarian governments, think that way any longer. So all you need to do is to kill, in my view, uh, say 20, 30,000 people with one bomb and you would have wiped out the other sites, not population, it's machinery, the government machinery and uh, they don't want that. Whoever is the head man will have to go. So even the most uh, uh, aggressive country uh, can be deterred by such a small attack. And one nuclear weapon can kill property drop 10, 10 15,000 people is what they did in Hiroshima. So if that's one weapon. To be on the safe side, you have two, maybe three, maybe four, but you don't need large numbers. Yes, sir. And, and 
moving forward from here, you have a chapter again on nuclear civil defense. You make it clear that given the geographical distance in South Asia between countries, right, an effective nuclear civil defense such as what President Eisenhower thought of in the 1950s, you know, blast sh- bomb shelters, you know, enough knowledge of evacuation methods, right, would be difficult to implement in uh, India specifically, given that it takes six to eight minutes for the missile to be launched from across the border to Delhi, right? And early warning systems of six to eight minutes is difficult to manage, right? So given this situation, uh, India today does not have any public guidelines of how to, oh, Indian citizens do not in public know what are the guidelines in the event of a nuclear attack. And the authority, the National Disaster Management Authority, as per your book, has some guidelines, but these are classified, right? So how does this opacity on behalf of the government and the NDMA specifically, you know, affect the safety of our citizens? And, you know, how important is it that the citizens of India, uh, people living in the subcontinent, you know, are aware of guidelines in the event of a nuclear attack? Well, what you say is absolutely correct in that uh, with this level of opacity where people don't know that some attack may come, you can't very well ask them to prepare for the attack. They don't even know it's going to happen. So it certainly comes in the way of civil defense. But, um, and in fact, during the US-USSR confrontation, the people in the US more knew that Soviet Union was their enemy, quote unquote, and that they and that they had weapons. So the populace was persuaded to distribute something, and many of them uh, built bomb shelters in their basements. Uh, all kinds of ideas were being thrown around. But in the India case, we don't really believe uh, it, uh, this matter is not discussed in the public. Most of the public know that we have something. But not more than that. So I don't think there's any real knowledge of the damage that the other side can do to you, against which you have to defend. People, some people said, in, in respectable people, oh, don't worry, we have now 20,000 more beds in the country. Issue is not the number of beds you have in the hospitals, but to avoid that whole thing in the first place. Yet others said, no, no, we can, we have, we have, we have a tunnel in which we can keep people. Yes, you can for the apex leadership. Makes sense that you take the top political military leadership and hide them somewhere. But the population in general, you are not going to be able to hide them. And the word civil defense refers not to what you do to the apex people. That is going to be done anyway. It refers to the general populace. So the ignorance of the populace about what the real danger, existing danger, is going to affect civil defense. Unfortunately, we may know it only after the fact. Yes, yeah, sir. And uh, I just, you know, recently we've had a lot of uh, interesting TV shows or movies uh, from Rocket Boys talking about Dr. Homi Baba and Vikram Sarabhai and how they were, you know, how close they were with the Indian leadership of the time that sort of made scientists or gave the scientists freedom from audits and democratic oversight. Right. On the other hand, we have, for example, Oppenheimer, uh, the latest movie that looks at how, you know, Oppenheimer himself was questioned and sort of lost his permissions because of democratic oversight and performance audits. Right. So give it and, and I've also heard that you have met Mr. Oppenheimer many a time and have interacted with the U.S. Uh, oversight when it comes to, you know, scientists and these kind of nuclear programs. So, you know, given this, that even today, our scientists, the Department of Atomic Energy, they they don't have democratic oversight or they don't have performance audits. So how successful or harmful has this been? You know, and, you know, just to sort of give you that counterpoint of, you've seen what happened in the US. You've, you've seen how Oppenheimer or the programs have had democratic oversight. Has that made their the U.S. program more robust, or you know, 
has that been has it had a better impact in that kind of a sense vis-a-vis our own programs well uh, incidentally out of regard for my professor i should say that hans beta was actually more involved in the program quietly in the background and uh, but my thesis and so on had nothing to do with weapons he could just do weapons on with the right hand side of his mouth with the left hand side to basic physics but i do want to mention his name uh he probably even comes in briefly in the open i mean movie i've not seen so anyway uh you were saying how much did it affect the us positively uh, the public knowledge of it or was it the the democratic the public 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 right so even in the us there is a little democratic oversight but there are senate committees and so on that's as good as Uh, which look at this and that has really helped them uh, ensure certain level of safety even now if uh, russia chooses to strike the us all the measures will be gone because by the time you hear about it it's not 5 minutes any longer it's half an hour there's hardly enough time and they don't have built in bomb shelters and so on in the us so they are not at all prepared to uh, pr- protect the bulk of the population everybody is given up on that that if there is a nuclear attack a large share of the people under the bomb will die and um, so this is something nobody is attempting any longer a good civil defense measure you ask them they won't say that because it's bad bad for the government so it definitely affect the fact that the public do not know about this danger allows the government to continue to go ahead without building anything the way of uh, bomb shelters or an ordinary bomb shelters won't do uh, this is not just second world war bombs is a nuclear weapons and even if you manage to rush into this shelter when you come out there's radiation everywhere so it's a much harder problem for defending the population i think there is no hope that the population in the us will be safe right no i mean my follow up question to that is sort of you know the lack of oversight on our scientists you know how has that affected our program visa we the oversight that we've recently seen at least in now we've seen in movies and conversations that the us has had at some level with regards to senate committees etc right so there's no audits there's no oversight so you know how has that impacted our nuclear program when you sort of have something like the us that has had very public uh oversight over you know its leaders like oppenheimer in from the manhattan project so well the fact that we don't have an oversight is very true and uh, not only the public but the parliament doesn't really know what's being done in the cabinet i don't know how many people know what's being done so this is still somewhat secretive nobody wants to ask nobody dares to ask you know, it's one of the secrets that everybody wants to keep protected so there is definitely no oversight from the general public which is not even aware of the danger about which it it's supposed to worry so this has been this has been a problem fortunately we have not had an attack fortunately no uh, the only countries that could possibly attack us are pakistan and china and neither of them has thought of doing it so far if they were to do it no matter what protection you have hundreds of thousands of people would be killed uh, and the public fortunately doesn't know all that and maybe just as well because you're not going to be able to build shelters for all of them yes yes right anyway, and 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 my last question to you sir i mean this is forward looking and there's a lot of conversations today about you know globally on transitioning to clean energy and you know nuclear power plays a role in this process but after what happened the events of the fukushima daiichi plant in 2011 uh, governments around the world took various approaches uh, from germany closing down its entire nuclear program uh, to different countries trying to reaffirm or rebuild the trust in nuclear power amongst the public right but given the level of general public distrust and sort of the large expenses involved in building a nuclear power plant uh what role do you see for nuclear power in the transition to cleaner energy sources or have we moved forward 
with other solutions where nuclear is no longer a key part of this process? Well, many of the people who worry about clean energy don't seem to mind nuclear. Uh, it's not the normal type of pollutant that they're worried about, gases, sulfur dioxide, and so on. And sure, it does. If there were to be an attack, there will be nuclear radiation all over, but uh, not in the normal course of things. Whereas other sources of energy, uh, whether it be dams, you know, uh, dynamos underneath, all of them in a continuous basis are functioning, and whatever pollution they are capable of doing, they're doing it. Whereas nuclear hasn't yet happened. And that is one of one of the reasons for the difference between these two. So nuclear is not viewed as one of the devils of uh, pollution by the activists and groups like that. Just hasn't come into the range of vision. Of course, they'll say radiation is a bad thing. Uh, mm -hmm. But the answer of do you want to remove the reactors and have whatever the energy is possible without it, there is no clear answer given by even the anti-nuclear groups. Nuclear weapons, everybody agrees. We are done there. Right. And that was my last question, sir. So thank you again uh, for joining us. Uh, critical mass is now out. Uh, you know, so go grab your book uh, to delve into the history of nuclear development in India. Thank you again, Professor, for joining us. Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure. Thank you.